All right, we'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's webinar uh, from Ortho Carolina. I'm Brian Loeffler and here with my uh, partner, Glenn Gaston. This evening, we're going to be giving presentations on a procedure we developed here in Charlotte for partial hand amputees called the Starfish Procedure. And we're also going to discuss the value of multidisciplinary care in the management of uh, upper extremity amputees. And we'll show you what we've set up here in Charlotte and see how we'd like to see that be replicated um, across the country. So initially, we'd like to thank uh, OSER, including Ty Hanners and Nicole Carley, for helping us to set this up, as well as Checkpoint Surgical uh, for extending invitations to those of you uh, on the call. At this point in time, I'd like to remind everyone to mute your phones. And as questions arise, please enter those through the chat. Uh, we'll start off with the first presentation, which I'm going to give uh, regarding the starfish procedure. And then after that talk, we'll pull up the chat and address questions that have been asked uh, throughout. And then we can also take questions over the phone. And then we'll move on to the second part of the presentation, which will be Dr. Gaston uh, presenting on our Reconstructive Center for Lost Limbs Clinic. So I'd like to just get started here with the starfish procedure, which is interosseous muscle transfers to allow for independent digital control of the myoelectric uh, prosthesis. So prosthetic options for partial hand amputees, aside from silicone and passive uh, prosthetics, um, myoelectric digits are an option, but traditionally they've all moved as a group and the training for these has not been very intuitive. Um, patients have been taught to open the fingers on the hand, to spread the fingers apart, and to close them to AD duct the digits or think to squeeze them together. These are not intuitive uh, thoughts and can take a lot of training to get prosthetics to work, and the fingers don't allow for individual digital movement and independent control. So the problem is that after digital amputation with a partial hand amputation, the interosseous muscles, as well as the lumbricals in the hand may be spared, and they may still have maintained nerve innervation and blood supply. And in fact, those interossei and lumbricals will still contract when a patient attempts digital flexion because those muscles are responsible for MP flexion, which occurs when in a grip initiation. So the question we asked was whether these muscles could be transposed into a superficial location while maintaining those viability. So here's a sketch of our initial concept of this. If we could tr transfer surviving interostei in the case of a partial hand amputation where the fingers have been lost, but the muscles could be moved to a superficial location on the dorsum of the hand, could we then place a surface electrode over each of those muscles, which would allow for detection of those interosseous contractions? Those contractions could then be read on a surface electrode, which would allow for individual digital control. They might can mute their phones, too. And what we didn't know when we came up with this idea was whether those transfers could actually be performed while maintaining the associated neurovascular pedicle to those muscles. So we started a three-part study. The first was a cadaveric study to determine the feasibility of whether the inner ossei could be transferred to the dorsum of the hand without damaging the nerve and blood supply. Following this, we initiated a clinical study to determine if we actually perform the, those transfers, would the sensory um, electrodes, the surface electrodes, now be able to detect those muscle contractions? And finally, could a prosthesis be created which would link each of those surface electrodes to an individual myoelectric digit and then allow each finger on that partial hand prosthesis to move independently and intuitively. So we started with a cadaveric dissection, isolating the hypothenar and thenar musculature, as well as all of the interossei on their neurovascular pedicles. On the right uh, side of the screen there, you see an image where we've uh, actually removed all the carpal bones and bones out to the digits, and we've just maintained the inner ossei along with the uh, superficial and deep arches, along with the innervation to all those muscles. When we reflected those muscles along with the neurovascular pedicles, 
Under the dorsal aspect of the forearm, as you see on the left, we saw that this resembled starfish. And coupled with the unique ability of the starfish to regenerate limbs and the potential ability for this procedure to allow people to have restoration of individual digital control, we named this the starfish procedure. So here is a schematic which demonstrates the transferred muscle groups. You can see um, the, this is a cross-sectional uh, diagram showing the metacarpals in an axial cut. And you can see on the dorsal aspect of the fourth and fifth metacarpals that we've moved the third and fourth dorsal interossei onto the dorsum of those metacarpals. And then for the volar aspect of the fifth metacarpal, those are the hypothenar musculature. And so that one hasn't even been transposed. So you can see what happens. Uh, muscle contracts for the middle finger, which is now on the dorsal aspect of the fourth metacarpal. That generates a electrical signal that can be detected by that sensory electrode and is direct drive controlled to that third mile digit. Same thing for the fourth dorsal interosteus, which is now in the dorsal aspect of the fifth metacarpal that controls that myoelectric ring finger. And the hypothenar musculature, including the abductor digitime minimi, flexor digitorum minimi, and opponent's digitime minimi, their contraction would then control the small finger digital flexion. So here is the surgical technique of the starfish procedure. This is a patient who had a partial hand amputation. We were able to save and preserve a partial aspect of the index finger through the middle phalanx uh, level. We prefer to preserve that when possible to allow for continued sensation and dexterity uh, with the thumb. You see in this case we reflected the skin, uh, subcutaneous tissue along with the extrinsic extensors and now we have the inner osteo exposed along with the metacarpals. You can see in between the bones there, when they contract, the, the sensor is unable to detect those contractions because of the depth and the magnitude is not great enough to be uh, detected with a surface electrode. But with the transfer, we can get them right the skin to allow them to be detected. So the first thing we do is we elevate the dorsal interosseus from the metacarpals. And here you can see first we have that second dorsal interosseus. We've sharply reflected that off of the third metacarpal. There's the third dorsal interosseus. And finally the fourth dorsal interosseus. So at first we're just elevating those directly off of the metacarpals. You can see the dorsal blood supply coming in. There's actually dorsal blood supply from the periosteum there and then the deeper supply coming from the superficial and deep arches. We then perform a transmetacarpal uh, resection. And as you can see in this video, we have, uh, we resect approximately three centimeters of the metacarpal and we're able to safely do that with mobilizing the inner osteo so as not to damage them or their blood supply. And that's gonna allow for the myoelectric digits to fit appropriately and to be of a similar length to the native digits. So once we've done those uh, resections, then we're able to move on to our next step of the procedure. And this is a very important part of the procedure here, and that's separating the dorsal and volar interosteus. So in this, uh, in this interosteus that we're looking at right now, we're looking at the fourth dorsal interosteus. So that's going to control the ring finger. And deep to that, actually, is the third bowler interosseus. So you see that's deep there. And we've actually developed a plane between those two muscles. We're preserving the blood supply to both of them. But we only want to transfer the fourth dorsal interosseus to control the ring finger. And the reason for that is that the third bowler interosseus controls the small finger. And so that would send conflicting signals to the surface electrode. So we isolate the fourth dorsal interosseus, and we're then going to reflect it to the dorsum of the hand. So you can see here, after we've mobilized the inner osteo, we noted in the cadaveric dissections where the blood supply was coming in. As I mentioned, there's dorsal periosteal supply, but here you can see that pedicle beautifully at the level of the proximal uh, metacarpal. And so you can easily mobilize that dorsal inner osteus from the volar inner osteus on that neurovascular pedicle without putting any tension or damaging it. And you can see it can be reflected either radially or ulnarly. 
So in this particular case, here you can see the third dorsal interosseous, which we've separated from the underlying volar interosseous. We're reflecting that radially. We're going to take the fourth dorsal interosseous, and again, that's going to control ring finger. We've isolated that from the underlying volar interosseous. We're going to reflect that on the dorsal of the fifth metacarpal. And then, as you see, I pointed out, we can also get control from the first dorsal interosseous and the hypothenar musculature, which can control a second digit, if that was required, and a small finger myoelectric digit. We then perform a soft tissue interposition, and we prefer to use the extrinsic extensor tendons along with the volar plate or flexor tendon sheath to create, as you see on the right side there, an interposition which is going to create physical separation between those muscles so that the surface electrodes can be placed directly over those muscles and avoid any crosstalk. So this is the first patient who ever underwent the starfish procedure, partial hand amputee, and we're asking him to move his middle finger, his ring finger, and now his small finger. And you can visibly see that those uh, dorsal interossei contracting following that procedure. This is a great video from our first post-operative uh, visit with another patient. On the left, you can see Dr. Gaston's uh, hand. He's got surface electrodes demonstrating when he attempts digital flexion and fires his interosseous muscles that the myoelectric hand seen there to the left does not move because the amplitude of that signal on the surface electrode is not great enough to initiate digital flexion. However, in another patient who's undergone the starfish procedure seen to the right, we place the surface electrode over the second dorsal interosseous muscle, and you can see when he attempts to move his middle finger, that the hand contracts. Now that benchtop uh, hand is not set up to do individual digital control, but if you move the surface electrode over each of the individual transferred interossei in the hypothenar musculature, with each one of those he was able to open and close the hand, demonstrating that the muscles remained viable and that we had nice independent signals for each of those muscles. So this is the first uh, time that our first patient wore a prototype uh, prosthesis. We have him do a ring finger now. We're having him do it on both hands. So you'll see he doesn't really need it. It's very intuitive for him to be able to do that. And now, uh, after some uh, modifications and fitting of the uh, final prosthesis, you can see he's able to very easily control each of his digits uh, individually. He's able to lift 20-pound uh, objects. He can pick a flower, open a car door. He uses it for things like a shovel and a weed eater, and he's able to do that uh, very intuitively. We've now done over 12 uh, starfish procedures here in Charlotte, and all of those tested have been able to generate strong independent EMG signals to control individual myoelectric fingers. You can see this patient is testing out his individual fingers for us as well. So the candidates for the starfish procedure, there are those who have undergone a, who have a non-replantable partial hand amputation, whether that's due to traumatic etiology, infectious etiology, or from vasopressor-induced ischemia and gangrene who maintain viable intrinsic hand muscles. Our principle is to preserve whatever viable musculature is able when performing an amputation so that we can reflect those muscles more proximally on their neurovascular pedicles and maintain that signal from the central nervous system to control a myoelectric digit. So in summary, the starfish procedure or dorsal interosseous transfer with multiple surface electrodes is an effective means to generate individual digital control. And this is the first procedure in prosthesis to allow this. This concept is applicable to more proximal amputations with maintained intrinsic musculature. The strengths of the procedures that allows for intuitive control. We can, we can incorporate existing technology and it's immediately applicable. And the surgery, as you've seen, is not technically demanding, so it certainly is a uh, is uh, very doable. So before we transition into the next part of our talk, we emphasize the point that we view amputation as a reconstructive procedure and not simply one that's ablative. In other words, thinking ahead, 
preserving muscle and nerve and blood supply to it when performing the amputation to capture those signals, those native signals, to allow for intuitive control. It's really an opportunity to prevent and treat uh, chronic pain. And with newer techniques in a multidisciplinary clinic, we can enhance psychological recovery. So we'd like to thank uh, all of our patients uh, who we see here in our uh, clinic with upper extremity amputations. I'd certainly like to thank my partner, uh, Dr. Gaston, who uh, we've been working on uh, a lot of this work with amputees for the last several years, and it's been, uh, it's been a great joy to expand the work that we've been able to uh, perform and uh, offer patients things that even just a few years ago were not available. So at this point in time, we would love to field questions. Um, a lot of times when we've given this presentation, it doesn't quite uh, sink in the first time around, so please, any questions that anyone has, uh, please, uh, please ask them now again uh, via that chat, or you can come off mute and ask that way as well, and we'd be happy to answer any of those questions. All right, well, I'll, we'll leave the chat box up, and we'll get the, the next talk kind of loaded up about establishing a clinic and the value of a multidisciplinary dedicated clinic for amputees. <clears throat> While Dr. Loeffler's getting it up, I'll tell you, so when we started this together, just like probably most of you, these patients, just we just saw them in our regular offices and didn't have a dedicated clinic just for amputees. And establishing a dedicated clinic had a ton of benefits that we really didn't expect. Um, let me see if I can get this off of this. We're trying to click on that crayon right there. See if now you can do regular stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to go into kind of some of those benefits that we found by starting a dedicated clinic, uh, which in the beginning was only a couple hours a week, I mean a couple hours a month, and now we uh, do a full half day a month, which at times rolls into nearly an entire day per month. So, all right. I think you can just go to the. Uh... I can't put this screen away. All right. Well, well, we'll move into the next talk, and then we can take some more questions at the end, either by phone or by chat. And so we established our reconstructive center for lost limbs a couple of years back, and I'm going to kind of run through what that looked like for you. So rewind to Charlotte in 2016. We were practicing at a very high volume level one trauma center. And Dr. Loeffler and I were seeing an increased amputee patient volume. There was evolving technology, there was new surgical procedures, TMR was on the forefront, and we had several research ideas for ourselves that really prompted us to move forward uh, and take this passion for taking care of amputees and develop a dedicated clinic for amputees. So the first thing we needed uh, was a vision, and our vision was that we could do a lot more together than we could individually. And our thought was that both surgeons could treat all patients. And so we see every single patient together as a team. And that really doubles your experience if you have someone you can do this with. So it increased our individual experiences and it just provide better care and attention for each one of these patients. We also invite our local prosthetists, orthotists, we have therapists, and we even have psychologists as well as nurse case managers who all come to this clinic and we go through this clinic as a team together. So the philosophy, the overarching philosophy is really to treat the whole patient. And one of the things we try to make clear to every patient is that we're treating the entire patient, not just one arm. And that includes everything from psychological screening at every visit, bringing patients together in a private waiting room, and when they have questions, uh, in the image on the lower right, that's actually the first patient that ever received the starfish on the left, talking to the second patient that ever received it preoperatively and telling him what it's like uh, in advance. And that's just something that's so special, you really can't recreate without uh, an opportunity like this. And then it created an opportunity for social support and networking for these patients and just trading practical advice. Is her first so this is a little piece on CNN about the Reconstructive Center for Lost Limbs. Hopefully you can hear it. The people here have harrowing stories. 
the ambiance is more friend's house than doctor's office. Doctors Brian Loeffler and Glenn Gaston are two of a few surgeons worldwide pioneering a state-of-the-art surgical procedure. He actually has implantable sensors in all the different muscles. Enabling the nervous system to communicate with artificial limbs. All right. And so that was just a little flavor for you, but the the clinic itself, like I said, it's a comprehensive uh, center for amputee care, and this is something that can be created at other places as well. We optimize surgical and medical management. Again, I mentioned we bring the prosthetist, the orthotist into the rooms. We talk together about each patient, what's the best prosthetic need for that individual patient, provide peer support and psychological screening. We come together with return to work strategies for the workers' compensation patients, and then we work on research and education as a team. As I mentioned, both of us are there for all of the patient visits. It's a detailed preoperative exam in postoperative management. Medications are reviewed at each visit. And in terms of OT, one thing that's extremely valuable to have is virtual limb training there so that patients can do virtual reality training with the therapist on site and they can help with them at home VR training as well. So it's really a team-based approach, which I don't think it's, we can say enough and really reviewing the challenges and barriers that these patients have, looking at are they surgically clear, do they need surgery, are they ready for surgery. Providing the documentation, which I think all of us know, one of the biggest hurdles sometimes isn't just the surgery that you perform, but it's getting all the necessary documentation so that these devices can be approved for patients. So working in concert with our local prosthetists, explaining what we want, what details need to be in our notes, so that they get approved sooner rather than later and patients aren't having to wait as long for their prosthetics. The psychological side of this is absolutely one of the biggest things we've noticed and run into. We're just finishing up some research papers now looking at uh, the incidence of PTSD and depression, which is something that we screen patients for at every single visit. And the incidence is quite high and we have appropriate referrals to psychological services. And in fact, starting this month, we're gonna have an on-site psychologist available for these patients in this clinic. So the mental health team is a real important piece to this. And I think it's something that everyone should be, at least have a close working relationship with if you're gonna take care of these patients. Another thing we implemented that's been tremendously valuable for patients is we have a private waiting room just for our amputee patients. So in our regular office, we have a separate room set aside where all of our amputees meet up when they first check in. They fill out all of their research forms there together. And that's the time where patients learn a lot about how to put their hair in a ponytail and how to p pick up, you know, change off the tabletop. So a lot of just peer-to-peer -peer learning from each other. And uh, that's some of the most valuable time I think that they spend. We also do some social events. We try to do a couple per year with our patients. This is a picture from a social thing that we had at one of the local breweries where Dr. Loeffler and I gave talks to patients. We had one of our patients play guitar and we just kind of had a fun time together and getting to know each other outside of the office uh, impacts that whole psychological piece to the puzzle. From an occupational standpoint, as I mentioned, I think it's nice to have the case managers attend. It's a great opportunity to talk to the patients and the case managers about what is your ultimate goal gonna be? Are we trying to get back to the same job? Do we need uh, job restructuring? Do we need to consider vocational rehab? What barriers are they running into? And we work through that as a team. In terms of research and education, uh, we think this is a critical piece to a clinic if you're gonna set one up. We do obtain DASH scores at every single visit, and we're actually establishing a REDCap database to be multi-center presently so, so that we're all collecting the same thing across the country. Looking at patients' pain, how often are they wearing their prosthetics? If they're not wearing them, what are the barriers uh, to them doing so? Have they returned to work? What's their instance of PTSD and depression? And we've got an amputee registry now, so all that data gets entered at every single visit. And that allows for uh, good publications coming forward and good education for our residents, fellows, as well as ourselves and our patients. One thing we've started that I would invite anybody that's got a vested interest in uh, establishing a clinic like this is we host a visiting surgeon program uh, in conjunction with the Hanger Clinic. And what that does is we have surgeons fly in once a month, and it's a comprehensive program. They bring their entire team, PAs, nurse practitioners, therapists, their local prosthetists, and it's a two-day course where they come in and get to spend time with us. 
And on the first day, which is typically the Wednesday, they have an opportunity to tour uh, the prosthetic hangar clinic down the street. And then we have a dinner that we host with them in the conjunction with Checkpoint Surgical. And Dr. Loeffler and I do lectures on TMR and on starfish procedure. Thursday morning, we go to the cadaver lab where the surgeons are educated how to perform these procedures. And they uh, have a hands-on cadaver lab with us, walking them through those, those procedures. The morning, we then from 8 to 12, have our Reconstructive Center for Lost Limbs Clinic. And on average, we'll see anywhere from 20 to 30 patients of upper extremity amputees predominantly, but also some lower extremities in that clinic. And then in the afternoon, we have our amputee surgeries, including starfish, TMR, angulation osteotomies for better fit, et cetera. So I think the future of a clinic like this, at least for us, uh, is to increase, we're probably going to have to expand the clinic offerings to have uh, to be able to accommodate the increased pace and volume that we're seeing. We want to continue to research and publish through this. We've partnered now as well with Atrium Health, which has an orthopedic residency, which is going to allow us to hopefully expand even into lower extremity APT care moving forward. And then also we're going to have an increased therapist presence within the clinic. The psychological resources, as I mentioned, are growing. And then fundraising, we're starting a fundraising called Arms for All, to raise money to be able to donate prosthetics uh, to those who don't have the necessary funds to afford them. Um, and then hopefully continued as well with the work return to work and the improvements uh, with enhanced function and ability to get patients back to the workforce. So that's it on the, on the clinic itself. These are Dr. Loeffler and I's emails. And uh, feel free to email us any questions if it's something you don't want to put in the chat. This is the number for appointments if you have patients that need help as well. So we're going to pull back up the chat. And if you don't want to chat and you'd rather just uh, unmute and ask a question out loud, we can field any of those at this time as well. And again, uh, if any questions uh, arise, we're certainly happy to discuss those uh, via email as well if, if uh, anyone on the call prefers that, um, whether it's questions about uh, patients or our clinic or the details on uh, surgical procedures that we've discussed uh, this evening or the uh, previous uh, webinar. It's a, it's a real passion of ours, and we certainly love to share the knowledge and experience that we've gained over the last uh, few years doing this. So we had a question here from Daniel about how many days a month we're performing amputee clinic. And it's a great question. So uh, 90 to 95% of the patients that we're seeing right now are upper extremity amputees. And when we started the clinic about two and a half years ago, we were starting off seeing six patients in a half a day, perhaps up to eight patients in a half a day. And now we're seeing 25 to 30 patients routinely on a monthly basis. And so we, we do it all on one day um, for now, for the most part. If there's patients that need to be seen outside of that clinic time, we'll see them on our individual schedules. But we do our amputee clinic uh, on the third Thursday, basically, of every month. And we set that up so that we have uh, surgeries for amputees on those days as well. So we'll do the office and the surgery um, in conjunction with one another. And we've seen a lot of growth, uh, a lot of growth from the clinic uh, patient volume um, over the last few years, and certainly see a, a trajectory increasing with time. Yeah, and it's amazing, uh, Daniel and everybody else, when you set up a specialty clinic like this, like Brian said. I mean, it was only we were seeing all these in our office just about two years ago when we actually set up the formal clinic, and it was just a half day a month uh, just two years ago. And again, that was seen about six to eight, and then as word gets out. Uh, it's an incredible group of patients who really have just been lost. I mean, there is that they get amputations by community doctors for the most part. Once their stitches come out, they get discharged home and basically find a process and all the best. So the clinic filled incredibly rapidly, and we'll probably have to go to a second day a month uh, relatively soon would be my guess, probably towards the end of this calendar year, just looking at current growth. <laughs>
All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we appreciate your time. And again, those are our emails if there's something you'd rather send privately. And um, thank you for the opportunity to do this. And we look forward to any future contact, and we'll hope to have a few more webinars moving forward. Thank you again.